Access Intimacy by Laura Marie My housemate, Leon, is disabled. We both have chronic pain and autism. Leon was new to the house. He saw that I could only reach half the chairs at our community dining room table because of my physical differences. My choices were limited. So Leon asked for help and moved the table to a different orientation in the room. It had been in the same place for many years, maybe 20 years. Then I could reach all the chairs and have more choices of where to sit. As time passes, housemates shift the location of other furniture in ways that block my access to all the chairs, but we try to keep the edges clear so that I can use the whole table like other housemates. Like many moves toward access, Leon's act of care benefits all of us. But I specifically feel loved that Leon moved the table. Leon cares about my body, and he's willing to endure a pushback from housemates in order to prioritize my ability to sit anywhere. Some people could see this as logistical or not that important, but Leon is telling me with his actions that my body is valid, my body's needs are valid, and I deserve access. This love tastes like beautiful golden honey. Mia Mingus Access intimacy is a special kind of intimacy where someone viscerally comprehends your access needs and cares with a deep respect for them. The term was coined by my disability justice hero, Mia Mingus. Access intimacy can form between two disabled people, but actually not both of the people need to be disabled. I have felt access intimacy with abled persons. How does access intimacy form? Maybe the other person can relate to what I need and has a similar need, or maybe they have a huge heart with tons of compassion. Maybe they are a lover who is attuned to me somehow, like some part of my soul hums at the same frequency their soul hums at. Not lover in the sense of someone I have sex with necessarily, but lover in the sense of here on earth to love. Here are some more examples of access intimacy. Bump. I went to the YMCA with my homegirl bag. It had just opened the new YMCA here in Eugene, Oregon, where I live. Bag and I waited in a long line to see if I could get a guest pass that day. After a few minutes, I realized a chair might help Bag, who's disabled with chronic pain. The line, like most lines, had no sitting options for disabled people, pregnant people, elders. So I had to be slightly brave to break culture's norms by scooting a chair over to Bag. In line, a little child was playing and bumped me. I was already in a heightened state of awareness, nervous from being in a crowded room in a new building. So it freaked me out to be suddenly touched without my consent, and I didn't see it coming. The form of autism I have, I have sensory differences and feel a huge reaction to touch. Finally, Bag and I got up to the YMCA worker who had a computer. Then I felt something weird on my leg that panicked me. I looked down and saw the same kid as before had dropped something on the floor and was crawling by my feet to retrieve it. He had touched my bare leg. I was jarred out of my conversation with the YMCA worker. The kid went away then did the same thing again, and I started to lose my crap. I backed away upset. I can't do this. I can't do this, I said. Say excuse me, a parent chastised the little kid. Of course, I wasn't mad at the kid or the parent. I was having a sensory response. 
that wasn't intentional, rational, or grounded in actual unsafety. My body was panicking from non-consent surprise touch. My panic was amplified by being in a busy, crowded, unfamiliar environment. Bag got between me and the kid. She gave me her headphones, which I held in my hands and was too overwhelmed to put on. I was temporarily frozen and nonverbal. The kid and parent left, Bag paid for my guest pass, and somehow Bag moved us out of that area of the YMCA. Are you okay? Bag asked. The kid kept bumping me, I said. It freaked me out. Yeah, Bag said. Thank you for helping me. I'll feel better soon, I said. Of course, Bag said. Bag never shamed me or blamed me for having a big reaction. It was her first time seeing me sensory upset like that. She was cautious and kind. Bag trusted me to be the same Laura Marie she knows. I held the headphones in my hands like a bouquet of flowers that symbolized I am loved. I hope to spend my life being close to Bag, doing access intimacy with her, as my spouse Ming and I do access intimacy with each other all day, in love, making family, with interdependence every day. We can endure crowded YMCA lines and anything together. Back, when I was emotionally overwhelmed and Ming wasn't around, Sometimes I was having a panic attack because my mom died. I felt alone in the world or I didn't trust my own body. I was terrified of death, others' deaths and my own. Then other life problems would swirl together with death fears, so I was really scared. Sometimes I would ask my housemate Jack to help me. Jack has non-binary gender and uses they-them pronouns. Jack believes in consent and knows how to love. I would text Jack, can you touch my back for 10 minutes? Jack would see my text, drop what they were doing, and say yes. We would meet and I would set a timer on my phone. They would sit by me and touch my back as I cried. I would flush out intense grief with Jack's caring witness. They helped me hold my pain. When Jack touched my back, I felt safe. Even though my mom died and I'll die one day, it's okay. My culture has not abandoned me. I'm a valid person. It's appropriate to have big feelings. My feelings are okay and I'm okay. Jack is not disabled, but Jack cares about people. We share access intimacy. When Jack held my panic with me, it was healing to be able to rely on them. I made an art about Jack after they had helped me a couple of times. The art has a bunny who's like me thinking about baby bunnies in a heart. The words of the art say, when I was with you, I wasn't afraid of dying. This art is about access intimacy. Trust, safety, and love, that's what I want my home to be like. Love. Access intimacy is one of my favorite ways of doing love. I hope I'm always holding others and held by others in ways that account for our entire selves, including our disabilities. My disabilities are sacred. They're part of who I am. They aren't an embarrassment. They are not failure. Just like I'm fat, queer, or any other aspect of who I am, my disabilities are okay. They're part of my experience as a person on earth. We don't need to hide who we are or what we need. All bodies are valid bodies. Access intimacy is a space where we don't need to fight for that. It's just a given that our bodies are valid and need what they need. 
We can collaborate on our comfort, survival, healing, and pleasure. Thank you to Mia Mingus for the term. And thank you to my spouse, Ming. Thank you to all my Access Intimacy buddies I mentioned today. And everyone who loves in all the ways of love. Just like I deserve Access Intimacy and my body is valid, you deserve Access Intimacy and your body is valid. I'm not going to dish up shame, and I'm not going to eat any shame that others dish up for me. No thank you to shame. What you need is okay. I would like to help form a culture, family, life, world, and place of worship where love is at the center, not money and not hierarchy.